Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. We're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Michael R. Oslan, a writer, policy analyst, historian, and scholar of Asia, who has been generous enough to take time out of his busy schedule to speak to us. Dr. Oslan will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will have a Q&A session with our audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once Dr. Oslin has finished his presentation. And please be sure to include your name and affiliation with your question. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. So let me now introduce our guest speaker today. Dr. Oslin is the inaugural Payson J. Treat Distinguished Research Fellow in Contemporary Asia at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He is also a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and the senior advisor for Asia at the Halifax International Security Forum. Previously, he was an associate professor of history at Yale University and a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo. And he was elected a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in 2018. He's the author of half a dozen books, among them Asia's New Geopolitics, Essays on Reshaping the Indo-Pacific, which was published by Hoover Institution Press in 2020. So I know we're all looking forward very much to hearing his presentation. And without any further ado, I will give him the floor. So Dr. Oslin, over to you. Uh, Ambassador Neary, thank you very much for that kind introduction and, and to you and to IIEA for welcoming me this morning and, and letting me talk with you a little bit about uh, Asia and uh, the competition between the United States uh, and China, the role of alliances and partners, uh, and, and really to honestly to have a discussion with you as opposed to me just uh, pontificating for uh, an hour. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep my remarks fairly short and then open it up to what I hope will be uh, a robust and, and interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm speak despite the, the lovely background behind me, I'm actually speaking to you from uh, Washington, D.C. So my comments uh, are, are very much with a Washington-based perspective. It, it's where I am located and where I do uh, my work. So uh, the, the U.S. view obviously is one that, that uh, informs the type of, of research and, and, and talks that I do, uh, but I think it's critically important for, uh, for Washington, for the U.S. to talk with partners and, and allies and, uh, and interested parties around the globe about what I think is the most critical issue of the day, which is um, the growing and, and worrisome competition and adversarial competition between the United States and China. Let me start off by uh, actually backing away from, from that to say that I think one of the big problems that uh, we in the United States have in dealing with Asia, um, there are two of them. One is that over the past decade or decade and a half, uh, we've really made uh, the issue uh, in Asia about China, as opposed to Asia or or the Indo-Pacific or whichever uh, rubric you you prefer, with whatever boundaries you decide to draw. But we've um, sort of been sucked into a black hole of thinking only or primarily about China, and then thinking about the rest of the Indo-Pacific in in a reactive sense. I think that's a big mistake. Secondly, uh, we've made it a long term, I would say decades long mistake uh, in sort of trying to go it alone. Now, I don't mean go it alone without partners in Asia. We have partners, uh, the United States, we have five treaty allies. Um, but we've, we've, unlike Europe, for example, we've always sort of thought about Asia as a one-on-one -on -one, uh, type of proposition, either 
bilaterally with uh, China or bilaterally with Japan or bilaterally with Australia or any number of partners. And only recently have we begun to break out of that mold. But I, I would say the, the, the decades long pull of thinking that the United States is really going to be going it alone in, in Asia uh, without a broad set of partners, even from outside the region, uh, has been something that's also hampered our um, hampered our efficiency and our, our effectiveness. So it's no surprise, I mean, you all know as, as well as I do, it's no surprise that the United States and China are in what I think can best be termed an adversarial relationship. Uh, we still sometimes call it a competition, uh, but compared to 10 years ago or so, almost no one calls it a partnership anymore. It's It's actually quite striking to think how quickly our own verbiage has changed over the past decade from uh, decade, decade, decade and a half, let's say, uh, from talking about uh, China as a, as a strategic partner, as a potential G2, uh, as a country that ultimately, if hesitantly, was going to not only be more cooperative in the world, but also liberalize eventually, thanks to being included in, in global trade and, and political networks, we've moved dramatically away from that, uh, almost to where everyone who was on one side of the boat in Washington has now rushed over to the other side of the boat. And if the boat was somewhat unbalanced beforehand, uh, thinking, I think, in a, in a somewhat naive and too optimistic Pollyannish sense that China was going to be a, a constructive partner. Now I almost worry that it's everyone's on the other side of the deck and that it's tilted the other way, which is that everyone thinks that China is an enemy. Now to put my cards on the table, uh, I will say that I think China is, is if not an enemy and, and if not an adversary, it is clearly not, and I don't think ever will be a friend of the United States or the liberal world. And so that would mean the EU, European and and uh, and liberal Asian nations as well. I don't think China has any interest in that. And when I talk about China, I'm talking in terms of policy about the CCP, about the Chinese Communist Party. But I also want to make clear that I am of the belief that the CCP has an enormous amount of support within China. It's become somewhat uh, de rigueur these days to say, well, Let's be clear, we're talking about China and not the Chinese people. I think we're, we have to accept, and quite honestly, I think we're a little bit afraid to accept that a great amount, number, percentage of the Chinese people actually support the CCP. Even if they're not party members, they support it because it is a party that has brought wealth, stature, power, uh, and influence to China. And, and in the, the lifetime, in the living memory, of hundreds of millions of people. So when I say that China is not a friend of the United States, I don't mean that individual Chinese may, or, or let's say the liberal world in Europe, I don't mean that they necessarily hate us or that they uh, that they want to invade us certainly, or, or, or even maybe supplant us. But I think it is very clear that China and especially the younger Chinese who are much more nationalistic, do not see themselves in many ways as connected with the, the liberal world that we like to think of. Of course, they may study in our universities, uh, they may come and work in our cities, uh, but they do not see themselves unlike so many other groups around the world who come to our, our societies, uh, that there is anything for them in it. And this, I think, both re reflects policy, but then also influences policy. I think there is Clearly, I, I don't think this is earth shattering news, a competition between China and the United States. It's not a competition where I think there's any risk of China attempting to invade the United States. I don't really think there's a risk of China attempting to invade Japan, for example, but for Beijing to be the dominant power in Asia, I think is without question its overall goal. I think it wants to be dominant economically. I think it wants to be dominant politically and militarily. And to the extent that it can outside Asia have the same type of influence and the same type of power. Uh, again, not necessarily, I would argue, to change our systems, but to ensure that our system does not change the Chinese system, that our system does not change uh, the CCP and risk uh, the CCP's hold on power or to, as, as the party has put it now for a, a decade, 
to bring Western notions of liberalism and, and, and democracy and civil rights and the like into China, which would be seen as undermining traditional Chinese culture and society. If anything, we need to grasp uh, something, that, and I think we're, we're getting better at it right now, but to grasp something that for decades, quite frankly, since the end of the Cold War, we did not want to uh, engage with, which is the idea that ideology is important. For years, you could hear in, in our capitals and in our financial markets that, ah, the Chinese, they're not really communists. They don't really believe in it. They're not really a Marxist-Leninist system. Um, the fact is they are, uh, but they are also a Chinese system. They are a, a Confucian system. They are a legalist system. All of these different strands have come together and, and mixed together along with a very hard Marxism-Leninism of the party to create a, a a non-reformist one-party state and one that believes in its ideology. It, it may not be the same ideology quite that Marx or Lenin or, or Stalin would have uh, articulated, but it believes very strongly in this ideology. It's what it tells itself. It's what it tells its people. Now, I don't think that Xi Jinping or anyone in Beijing expects us to accept their ideology, but they are making a clear division uh, a, a clear marking between themselves and us in terms of how they view the world, how they view the role of, of the state, how they view the role of individuals uh, and the like, and that we have to take that seriously. I would say that um, there's the old quip of, of Irving Kristol, the, the political thinker and uh, father of what's often called neoconservatism, that a neoconservative is a liberal mugged by reality. Well, I think that uh, a China hawk or a China realist is a China dove who's been mugged by reality. That those who for 50 years hoped and thought and worked towards a more cooperative relationship with China are finally recognizing that despite their best efforts and, and quite frankly, despite the good idea uh, of the good intentions, that the, the attempt to make China a more cooperative and, and even liberalized power was a good thing to try, that it has failed. Uh, and we do ourselves not only a disservice, but we put ourselves at risk if we don't accept this. Now, there is still a debate going on in, in this, my country, and I would argue in, in, in countries around the world, but uh, you know, I can talk best about the United States. Um, you know, historians like me will look back eventually and try to figure out when this shift occurred. Was it 2017 with Donald Trump? Was it, you know, 2015 with Barack Obama and the militarization of the South China Sea? You know, when exactly was the shift starting uh, in, in Washington? And that's, that's important because we're in still the early days, the first decade of this shift. And we're still attempting to move past a 40-year period, essentially a 40-year uh, um, um, era of, of engagement with China that started uh, when relations were normalized in 1979, even stretched back a little earlier, of course, to the Nixon outreach in 1972. Um, but we're beginning to move past that, and yet what we are moving towards is not yet fully clear. We, we, don't, we don't yet know, and yet there is still a struggle here in this country between those who believe in a, in a much harder line against China, and I would include the Biden administration in that, and those who, who remain committed to engagement, particularly scholars, those in the academy, um, uh, certainly the business community, Wall Street and the like, London, let's say, um, who believe that we must engage with China uh, primarily for their self-interest, uh, either their access or, or for their business, but because uh, they think that that remains the only way to, to really ensure uh, that we can attempt to have any influence over Beijing. I mean, I really think that those days of influence are over. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's very clear. Um, you know, depending on what type of policy tools you want to use, days of coercion might still be ahead of us, uh, certainly on, on both sides, but days of coercion, um, days of, of attempting to make the best of a bad situation. Um, but the idea of, of engagement, to me at least, is one that I fully understand the impulse and I understand why so many would argue that we need to continue to do that. Uh, but in reality, that there is very little chance, quite frankly, 
um, that the type of engagement that we both had with China and the type of engagement that we thought we would ultimately get, which means largely cooperation, can ever be achieved. So that leaves this, this question of what do we do uh, and, and how do we do it? And I think one of the big problems is we haven't decided what we want to do ultimately, right? You can't have policy without a strategy and you can't have a strategy without a goal in mind. Uh, and that may sound you know, uh, either simplistic or obvious. Um, I live in Washington, we're all masters of the obvious in Washington DC, but uh, I think it is, it is nonetheless important uh, to recognize that I, I don't think we yet know what we really want to see at the end of whatever this process is in Asia and the Indo-Pacific and with China. The current phrase, the phrase that is used by the Biden administration was used by the Trump administration is a free and open Indo-Pacific. It actually comes from the, the late and former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who came up with that articulation and that formulation. Um, but it's actually something that goes all the way back to the beginnings of American involvement with Asia back in the 1840s, when we were a weak nation that couldn't bring to bear, for example, the power uh, of the Royal Navy or the British. We asked and expected both of, of the Chinese, who were the, the primary target of our, our trading and missionary activities, but also of the Europeans, um, that we be allowed and all nations be allowed free trade in the region. Uh, it was a, an impulse that we maintained throughout the 19th century uh, up to the open door notes uh, when the United States made the same demands and expectations on the European colonial powers that China would be kept whole and, and, and open uh, of course, for us to trade as much as they were. It was the same impulse ultimately that manifested uh, our, in our involvement in World War II. Now, of course, we did have a colony. We had the Philippines, the United States did. Um, but the, the larger idea that no hegemon, an aggressive hegemon, would be able to dominate the Indo-Pacific, such as Japan, was why we got involved in World War II and the Pacific War. And then afterwards, in 1945 and onward, why we maintained alliances and troops in the region was to maintain the openness of the system. So the free and open Indo-Pacific is not anything new. Uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very old idea, but it's, it's, a, it's certainly an imperfect end goal. I mean, what, what does free and open actually mean? I don't think we've ultimately determined that, though there are some common sense ideas to it. Um, but more importantly, does it mean that all of, of Asia is, is free? Well, certainly China is not free and Laos is, is not particularly free and North Korea is not free. Sadly, it looks like Burma uh, remains uh, unfree or has gone back to being unfree. So what do we mean by free? And similarly, what do we mean by open? China and the United States are among each other's largest trading partners, even after COVID. In fact, after COVID, Chinese exports to the United States have increased. They haven't decreased. There's been none of the real decoupling that everyone talked about. Maybe we'll decouple a little bit on, um, uh, on uh, semiconductor chips. Um, but but if, if you're talking about openness, we're just as open in terms of trading with uh, the Pacific and the Indo-Pacific as we were uh, 10 years ago or five years ago or 30 years ago. So what do we actually mean by a free and open Indo-Pacific? So I think that we really don't know what we in, in the United States want, and, and I'm not sure that our, uh, our partners know uh, what they want either. Um, let me offer a, a historical um, analogy uh, or, or maybe a, an historical reference that I've been thinking about that may, I'm not, it doesn't give us an answer, but I think it may help us think more clearly about what we face. We often hear the terms balance of power. I mean, we've obviously, we've heard that in Europe now for, uh, for several centuries. Um, my mentor in, in graduate school, uh, his name was Paul Schrader, uh, was probably the eminent U.S. diplomatic historian of, of the um, late 18th uh, and early 19th centuries, argued that what we usually talk about is a balance of power. We use the term all the time, right? We have to maintain the balance of power. After Napoleon, there was a balance of power, so on and so forth. Um, what we think of as the balance of power really wasn't a balance of power. The balance of power was what Europe uh, endured during the 17th century and much of the 18th century, which was a series of endemic wars 
uh, the Anglo-French wars, uh, the Anglo-Dutch wars, uh, Russian wars in its near abroad uh, and the like, uh, obviously the Napoleonic wars, that that was what a balance of power really was. It meant that all states were trying to balance against any, any neighbor or any of the other uh, states that were attempting to become hegemons, that, that there was a whole series of actions and policies that were undertaken for, quite frankly, close to a, a century and a half to balance out power and reduce the power of other nations. What we think of commonly or popularly as a balance of power after Napoleon my, uh, my mentor, Professor Schrader, argued, was really better described as a political equilibrium. Now, the words are close, right? Balance and equilibrium. And, and the way they were used, particularly in the French language, you know, is very close. But the French language also was very clear that after Napoleon, there was an equilibrium in Europe. Now, what was an equilibrium? An equilibrium was where all parties agreed to the status quo. They all felt that the post-Napoleonic settlement, and this includes France, but critically includes Austria and Prussia, as well as uh, the UK and Russia, felt that the system was legitimate, that it looked out for their interests, that there were two benign hegemons, right, the UK and Russia, and yet the smaller states, Prussia, the Italian states, Austria, France, all were assured of their rights their territorial integrity, their sovereignty, and that their voice would be listened to. And that's what made for well over a generation that system so successful. So why do I bring it all up other than as a historian, I, I think it's interesting and I like it. I bring it up because I think that, that clarifying between a political equilibrium and a balance of power actually explains the two different strategies that the United States and China have followed. Now, uh, just to be pedantic for a second, when Professor Schrader was talking about this, he was talking about them as international systems. There was a system of a balance of power, and then there was a system of political equilibrium. I'm talking about them as strategies. What I think China's strategy is very clear has been a balance of power strategy. It has to, been to balance against the United States, to chip away at the United States' influence, power, if we want to call it post-1945 hegemony, to set up its own institutions when it could, such as its own development bank, its own international institutions, uh, its own pan-Asian uh, initiatives, such as the, the One Belt and One Road, um, in essence, not to see the post-1945 system as legitimate. Conversely, what has the United States been doing since 1945? And particularly, let me say, since 1991 and the end of the Cold War. I think what the United States has been doing has been pursuing a political equilibrium strategy, meaning we thought once the Soviet Union had collapsed, once the Cold War was over, that there was a political equilibrium. Now, it was obviously a liberal equilibrium in our favor, where unlike in Europe in the 19th century, there, was not, or there were not two hegemons, there was one hegemon the United States, which viewed itself as a liberal benign hegemon. So everything that it tried to do was to maintain the political equilibrium, which is why it didn't challenge China, because to do so would have been to revert to balance of power. So for example, uh, just yesterday, just to give a quick example, uh, um, new, very high resolution, very detailed photographs of China's South China Sea artificial islands and military bases were released. You can go online and look at them. It was in a bunch of the headlines today. So when these islands were starting to be built in the, the mid 2010s, the Obama administration did nothing about it. And the United States was still much more powerful than China. Um, there was always the fear that these islands could be used to upend what we might call a balance of power in the South China Sea, but we were more worried about engaging in risky actions against China because we thought we, what we were really doing was trying to defend this equilibrium. And what was that equilibrium? Well, it was open trade. It was open political engagement. It was free flow of people and ideas across borders. We thought for many years, and particularly after 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the, the, the second phase, the really important phase of Chinese reform under Deng Xiaoping, uh, 
which started in 1992, we thought that, well, of course, China supports this political equilibrium. Why? Because it benefits from it, because it, it gets as much access to the world as any nation. It's becoming, going to become rich and wealthy. It's going to grow a middle class, and that middle class ultimately will demand some level of political liberalization. So we, what we want, thought we were doing was defending an equilibrium that Beijing had as much interest in as we did. When in reality, I think Beijing was playing a balance of power game, which is why today we can now talk about a militarized South China Sea. It's why we talk about cyber warfare and, and, and regular cyber attacks against the United States and allies and, and probably Ireland as well, I'm sure, as a feature, not a bug, of Chinese security policy, of why the influence and propaganda campaigns that have gone through all of our nations. Uh, and just now, just this week, uh, Britain is confirming that it will shut down, for example, the Confucius Institutes, which are state funded, often, though not always, but often propaganda outlets on university campuses, why the propaganda campaigns of Beijing were so successful. We can also understand why it was that China did not do anything in the initial days of the COVID outbreak in Wuhan to inform the world, to share information and scientific knowledge so that we could have done a much better job, hopefully, we'll never know, at capping off the pandemic because China sees itself in opposition to the liberal world, to the Western world. It sees it as, as a threat to the party, the party's way of life. It sees itself as balancing against, chipping away against an illegitimate system that it is trying to reform. So let me wrap up so we can get to questions. By saying that um, I don't have a full set of answers, I have, I have ideas about what we should do, although many of them are things we're already doing. Um, but I think if we, if we articulate the idea that we really are in a balance of power system, as opposed or balance of power uh, dynamic as opposed to a political equilibrium dynamic, then we can be more realistic about the China challenge. What, what is to, to wrap up then the best, I think, short-term policy? Well, this may shock many of you, many of you may drop the call at this point, but I think it was actually what the Trump administration was trying to do, at least what they articulated doing, even if they didn't fully do it. And, and since they only had one term, we'll never know how much they actually could have, have carried it through. But we do see that the Biden administration has actually adopted most of the Trump policies, not all of them, but most of them. This is what I would call a policy of reciprocity combined with strategic or selective decoupling. So the reciprocity is something, again, it, I'm, I'm sure in, in uh, Ireland's history and in European history, but certainly in American history is a time-honored tactic and strategy that goes back uh, centuries, in fact, in our country goes back to George Washington, who used reciprocity to force the British to recognize diplomatically the United States and open trade with them after the revolution and after independence. But reciprocity uh, is something that I think the Trump administration was trying to do, saying that it has to be a level playing field, meaning giving up the idealism that you're going to change China and instead accepting that what you need if you want to engage with China is a, is a level and fair playing field on things such as Confucius Institutes versus American centers, the number of Chinese uh, reporters in the country versus American reporters in China, certainly trade issues, right? That was, we forget the, the Trump administration uh, launched a trade war against China, the most of those tariffs. In fact, I think all of those tariffs are still in place and the Biden administration, which keeps talking about dropping some of them has not yet done so. So reciprocity as the first part of the policy. The second part of the policy, strategic decoupling. I think we haven't gone nearly far enough. I think we have to go much farther. Um, it, it, the, the focus that we've uh, made is on semiconductors, which are critical. Yet, uh, we first of all, we haven't done enough on that, uh, and I can talk about some of those specifics, but more broadly, uh, the, the question of access to American high-tech research institutes, access to uh, American um, cultural institutions and organizations, again, because we're talking about the influence campaigns. Um, uh, you know, again, the, the question, which is a tough one for universities about the number of Chinese students that should be allowed in, and should we be, for example, more careful with graduate students and undergraduates. There's a lot of, of different questions of selective uh, decoupling 
that we should be thinking about, certainly protecting our supply chains, which goes way beyond semiconductors. It gets to rare earths and electronic components and, and rubber for the tires of our, of our trucks uh, and the like. It gets to the question of, um, which is both one of reciprocity, but I think more importantly of strategic decoupling of Chinese investment in the United States and questioning the degree of, of investment. But obviously it also is the decoupling on the telecommunications side of banning Huawei and ZTE from our telecommunications networks. So a lot of that's being done, but I think we haven't gone far enough. And I think we haven't gone far enough because we still, for example, pushed by Wall Street or pushed by, uh, by many academics, believe that we can engage with China because ultimately China agrees in the legitimacy, in the legitimacy of the system that we set up, i.e. These, these advocates still believe in political equilibrium. Whereas I think Xi Jinping has made it beyond evidently clear that he is pursuing a balance, a traditional balance of power strategy to reduce American power, to reduce liberal power, and to chip away uh, at the, the system and the network that we created after 1945, and particularly after 1991, which uh, reflects our values, reflects liberal interests, and quite frankly has brought, with all of its imperfections, brought more overall wealth and more opportunity to more people than any other, though it certainly could be more perfected and, and become better. So let me end there. I've, I've talked for about a half an hour and I know uh, we should be getting to questions. So thank you.